My name is Jerry Bond, and I represent Ben In Ministry, a worldwide TV ministry that is going to bless you today. May the glory and the presence of God our Father through Jesus His Son by the Spirit that develops and holds and is in us go all over this world. And may the people see and know that God is alive, that He is dealing with His people. He's bringing salvation, redemption, and repentance to His people to restore them to a right relation. May the glory of the fire that's in the river flow upon you. May the river of life that is in Christ Jesus flow into us because in him we can do all things and all things are about him. We must come to a place where we realize that the ministry is all about Jesus and Jesus is everything. May this bless you today. May you see the glory of the Lord. May you be in, uh, just his presence will overshadow you and we give you all praise and all things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Let's go... Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're, we're so glad everybody's here. Father, we praise you and we thank you for another day to worship you and praise you. And we thank you for our understanding of the word. And we thank you, Father, that you've led us and you are leading us by your spirit. And we know that now is the day. Today is the day that the kingdom of heaven is wide open in us. That the spirit of God is leading each of us to come to the fullness of the spirit and to walk hand in hand with you, Father. We know that this is your day. May the words today through the scriptures open our eyes and our heart to walk more closely and to understand what holiness and sanctification and righteousness and peace and joy in the spirit means to each of us. Let us lay down the thoughts and the intents of our heart for a little while and let our spirit be open to the thoughts of your heart, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Today is an unusual day for me. We're going to talk about thoughts, attributes, and actions. Thoughts, what you think about, what you give attention to, and what you take action upon. Now we live in a, tr a tumultuous time. We live in a time when people have to make decisions every day whether they're going to live or they're going to die. So let's read some scriptures to build the base on them and then we'll go into it. In Romans chapter 12 verse 1. It says, I urge you therefore, brethren, in the mercies of God, to present your body as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed in this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the perfect will of God is, and that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say that every man among you not think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but he ought to think his sound judgment and has allotted a full measure of faith. This next one is in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. And we're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of the anointing. And the last one, is this one. It's in Philippians, the fourth chapter. And it says, Rejoice in the Lord. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men that the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, if there's any excellence and anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things and these things you have learned and received and heard from me, and then the peace of God shall rule in you. Every day you, me, the whole world has thoughts. Thoughts good, thoughts bad. And so as we approach something, we begin to wonder how and what do we do? Now let me give you an idea of this. A, a little while back my wife fell and, and, and or she first of all she was working with her flyers and she worked and, and stayed at it too long and she strained her lower back. So then, then she began to have lower back pain. So we go to the doctor. So here's the, here comes the thought process. You think about what's wrong with you. You begin to think, well is this job I got or this life I'm living, or you begin to question, you begin to look, you begin to look deep in within yourself. Is this really of you, Father? Or you question yourself. 
And there's something in all of us that draws us to the threshold of coming to, to Jesus our Lord as personal Savior. But in all this, we try to walk daily. And so you'll see people say, well, I'm just walking with God. And, you, and, and then you watch them real closer and they'll say, you'll watch and you'll see that they're not really living as according to the way they are putting forth. In other words, they're, they're like they're double-minded. Now, they're not double-minded because when the pressure comes on, when you have a pain or you lose your job or there's a travesty or, or, or somebody gets hurt or, you know, all kinds of things that happen, and we dwell on that, we, twin, we tend to look at it. So as you think about what is happening, so the next thing we do, we go to the doctor and they start ordering all these tests, you know. We got a test to prove that you haven't got this, this, and this. Well, meanwhile, your mind is running what if and why me? What if and why me? And why at this time in my life is this happening? So you begin to question what is the plan and the purpose and how is God going to get the glory? Now it says count it all joy when trials and tribulations befall you. Don't thank God for the, the, the sickness or the disease because we know that's of the devil. But thank God he's going to take you through it. Now when you get long in tooth and hoary headed, in other words beyond 40, you're going, to, you're going to see and look at things in a little different light than when you were 15 or 20 or 30 because you think you're invincible. When you get older, your thoughts change to different thoughts. You're not necessarily chasing after the boy or girl that you were once madly in love with and thought you couldn't do without, or the job or the car or whatever you were chasing, the thoughts that you were putting. The Bible says in Proverbs, it says, As a man thinks, so is he. And Jesus says every thought has to be brought to account and to the Lord and to the anointing. So when we begin to understand that as our thought process comes forward and as we go through the, the every day of life, we have either a piece about what we're doing or a piece of not what we're doing. Okay, so we go to the doctor and they do all these tests and they say, well, and over a period of like three months, they send you to various people and do various tests and all the things, and absolutely none of them prove that there's anything wrong. Okay, so you got zero. Well, one of them sees a little something, a little nodule supposedly in the MRI, so they sent us to a neurosurgeon. Well, the neurosurgeon and his uh, physician, his assistant began to look at it, and they think they see something that doesn't look right with the big C word. So the big C word causes fear and panic and causes you to think, well, why me? And so you begin to question. Or maybe in the middle of the night, and I'll tell a story about this in a moment, about a, a man with brain cancer who called on Thursday night, late at night. And I'll explain that a little more in detail in a moment. But as you begin to think about this, and it begins to build up in you, and it says in 2 Timothy 1.6 that God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of sound mind. So we have to have a sound mind. The dwelling place of the spirit is in our spirit and our mind must come to peace. So what happens to you is in your mind you begin to think about, well, do I have cancer? So I was thinking, they, they decided after they saw this little thing that they would set us up with a cancer doctor. So within 24 hours they set us up and we go on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock and we fill out all the paperwork and you know, you tell them everything. And, you know, they really don't need any tests because you've already told them all the symptoms. You've already told them everything that's happened. Now they're just looking for something to be a bugger boo in, amongst you or something for more to you fret. Now, in your mind, you have to declare to yourself, this has to come to bottom line. This has to be the bottom of your faith. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of not, things not seen. So you must make the decision that you're, you're going to look to God no matter what no matter what the result, no matter what, and anything can happen. And so as we go and the, test, the doctor examines and does all the things he does, he says, no, there is no cancer. There is nothing cancer. So the load lifted and, the, and the, the whole situation changed in a matter of moments. But let's say that there was cancer. Let's say that there was. Now let me show you a lifestyle in two women, a man and a woman rather. In, in 2 Kings chapter 4, there's a woman named, uh, El, the man named Elisha, and there's a woman named the Shumanite woman. Well, the Shumanite woman saw the man of God coming by, and the man of God came by regularly, so she built a room on her house for him to sleep and to rest himself and refresh himself. And so one day, he told her, says, what can I do for you to repay you? Now, here comes the thought process. So she's beginning to think, well, she said, I'm old and I'm barren, never had any children, and I would like a son. He says, a year from now, you're going to become pregnant, and in a time season past, you're going to have a son. 
Well, the child was born and he grew to, to be into teenagers. And then one day he went into the fields to help glean the crop, to reap the crop. And he says, my head. And he fell over. And so they carried him into the, into the house and put him on the, the prophet's bed. So here comes the thought process. What is she going to think? And why did the boy die? And why did God give her a son? And then him to die like this. So we began to question and we began to look broadly at herself. Now we're thinking about the big C word in your life and other people's life. The big cancer. You must understand that only God gives you breath and only God takes breath. Satan cannot kill you even though it says he can come to kill, to steal, and destroy. But he must have permission to kill you. So you have to look within yourself. Am I trusting God or am I going to look at the other? You also have to look at the attributes of this or attitude of this. What is the attitude of my mind towards this and what action am I going to take on it? When I know that I have been found and been ordered by the doctor, I decided to go to the doctor. That was the number one. That was the attitude that you're going to have against your situation. Then you're going to decide whatever the doctor tells you to follow his action, follow his words with some kind of action or no action or lack of action. But here's the Shumanite woman. She's, this boy dies, so she tells her servant to, to saddle up her donkey, in other words, and so she rides over to where the man of God is. Now, when you go to God, you must understand that God is not talking about the use of doctors, medicines, or other things, even though he can use those things if, he's, if he so desires. But generally, God says, I am the Lord that heals you. By my son's stripes, you've been made whole. When you take the communion bread... That represents your and my healing. So we take it unwarrantly. We take it without judgment of ourselves. So therefore we suffer the consequences of taking the, the wafer, the, the bread of life. We take that unworthy. And so therefore we suffer the consequences of. Before I went astray, before I was afflicted, I went astray. So we think we're invincible. We think we're all these things. So we have this thought process that I can get by with this. Or we have an attitude towards that that it's okay for me to live like this. Or we take actions every day that are unbecoming the walk that we profess we're going to be. So we began to question. Well, here comes a Shumanite woman. She's saddling her, her little donkey. And she rides over to where the man of God is. And Gehazi, the man, the prophet's uh, service says, there comes a Shumanite woman. He says, the Spirit of God hadn't told me what her problem was. So the man of God didn't know. But when she got up, here's her response. All is well. Now, it's not all well. Her son is laying over on the prophet's bed dead. It's not well. You went to the doctor. You're not feeling well. And the doctor told you this, this, and this. Now, you have to make the decision. This is where, it comes, this is where the kettle and the pot comes to boil. When you realize that, you have to make the decision. Am I going to trust God, even if it is a bad report? Now, her confession was right. She was saying all is well. In reality, all was not well. But you have to see this before you get it. You've got to get it before you got it. You've got to understand, to get things from God, you've got to believe in your heart or take an attitude towards your heart that you're going to take action and no matter what, you're going to trust God. No matter what. When the chips are down... You're not moving. You're not going to be swayed by anything someone tells you. So here we are. The Shumanite woman says, all is well. He tells his servant, says, go over and put my staff upon the boy. He lays his staff on him. And when Elisha gets there, she says, I am not leaving you. I'm not leaving the man of God. I am not leaving listening to what God has to say. I'm not moving from this. Now, most preachers won't preach this because they're afraid that if they pray or if they act in faith and it's the opposite of what you're seeking, you're going to say, well, their prayer didn't mount to anything. But you've got to put your bottom line is this. In every situation, God is going to take you through it and he's going to take everything that's bad and make something good happen to it. He's going to take that situation and make something good. Now, how is he going to make something good if you're dead? He can't. So you have to live, and you have to make the decision to live, and you have to decide not to will yourself to die. So you make the decision. So Elisha goes in, and he lays on the boy mouth to mouth, chest to chest, and the boy comes back alive, and he gives him back to mom. Well, the very next chapter is the fifth chapter of 2 Kings, and it's about Naaman the Syrian, who was a commander of the, in the Syrian army, and a very gallant man, and a very trustworthy man, and he had leprosy. So he goes to the king of Syria and he says, why don't you go over to, to Israel? They have a man over there, a prophet of God. See what he says about it. So he loads up and goes over there. And meanwhile, they give him a little 
Jewish slave who's about 12 or 14 years old, and she's his attendant. When he gets over there, Elisha says, go down and dip in the river Jordan seven times. And he said, well, is not the rivers around Damascus much cleaner and much better? Why can I not do this? So here's you, here's me, and we're looking, we're taking thoughts, and we're beginning to look an attitude at it, and we're beginning to say, well, I'm going to go do this on my own. I'm going over yonder. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And so we see people die. We see people never get healed. We see people do all kinds of silly things because they're unwilling to listen to what the Word of God says. The Word of God says, Trust in me with all thy heart. Lean not on thy understanding, and thou shalt have the righteousness that I've given you. So you're not leaning on your understanding. You're leaning on His understanding. You're walking in the power and demonstration of the Spirit, and your attitude towards it, I am going to do whatever the Word of God says. But you and I know that every one of us will get right down to where we're on the, go, uh, the starting point at the gate and we got to step out in faith and because of the attitude of those thoughts, because of the thinking in the mind, we're going to say, maybe I better go have that test or maybe I better take that aspirin or maybe I better do this or that. So we begin to place excuses and road bridges and, and potholes in the road in front of you that you cannot go through and so we build up a wall around us and we withdraw from the things that God has for you and I. Or we will look at the religion, or we'll look at the situation, or we'll look at someone else other than God. I'm telling you, the governments of this world are man-made, and they will not survive. They, none of them will survive. Only God's kingdom is going to survive through all of this. So you better get aboard. You better get your hat, your coat, and say, I'm going with God, irregardless of what's happening. Now, if you have thoughts about something, those thoughts were put there either by God, or by your own thinking, or by the enemy. So what does it line up with? So the action you take will be determined by the way you approach it. Let's say you are lacking in money. Let's say that your job is no good. Let's say that you're working 24-7 and you're not making any money and you're not getting any farther ahead and you're saying, why is the problem? Well, I'll tell you what the problem is, is because you're not a cheerful giver. You're withholding the 10% that belongs to God. And when you do that, that is going to take away the, the bounty and the benefits because God loves a cheerful giver. You say, how can I live on the 90% that's left over? How can you not live on it? If you are a cheerful giver, God will expand that. Read it in 2 Corinthians 6, uh, 9, verse 6, 7, 8, and 9. You'll see it for yourself. Go and try it. Same thing works for, for, for healing of your body. Same thing works for salvation for someone. How do, you get, how do you get healed? For with the heart you believe, with the mouth you confess. So you begin to think about the thought you're thinking, the attitude towards that thought, and the way you go at action. What is your action? All right, you get up every day, you, you do your little routine, you clean up, you do whatever, you get your family going, whatever you're doing, you do that every day. And you get in your little routine, and then you try to think about what am I going to do today, or what am I supposed to be doing. And so you try to work this all out. When you, let me ask you a question. When you go put a resume in for a job, or a position, or you're going to start a business, who gave you those thoughts? Where did those thoughts come from? Did you dream them up? Was it inspired by you, or was it inspired by the Spirit? Well, I'll tell you, if you're a Christian, it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, it says you're led by the Holy Spirit. All that are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Daughters, you're not bastards. You're not outside the, the temple. You're, you're inside the temple. You're in the Holy of Holies. You're walking with God. You're blessed. But when you begin to understand that God requires all of you, all of me, spirit, body, spirit, soul, every part of us, our finances, our kids, our, our whole family. He requires that of each of us. We will never experience the fullness of God until we make the decision to serve Him with everything we are, with all of our gusto, with all of our being. But generally, we're not like the Shumanite woman. When death is at the door, we, we will start crying and we'll start mumbling and we'll be sympathetic, which is not a good word. You should have compassion, but not sympathy. Sympathy gets you nowhere. Don't send somebody a sympathy card. Send them a love note. Tell them you're, love, you're loving them and you're thinking about them and you're praying for them. Don't send them sympathy. There's no sympathy in somebody dying or sick. There's, nothing, there's no good in that. Understand what you're doing. You look closely, more closely at the things that are happening. So you begin to question, what is the thought process I'm in? What is the attitude that I must have? 
and how should I go about it? And then what is the result of what we're doing? What are, what are we hoping to gain? You suit up a football team and you put them on there and you'll see some coaches that literally work you and bring you to cohesion. They, they work you till you come to a cohesive unit. The body of Christ is fragmented today because we have so many religions in the earth, we have so many denominations that people really don't know what to believe. Some people believe that you can live like a junkyard dog, do all the things you want to do, and you're going to get to heaven irregardless of your lifestyle. I want to know when I get to heaven that I'm going to receive those rewards that it talks about in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. When we go before Jesus and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. So you began to question what is your lifestyle and why is this happening to you? And what is God's purpose of allowing it to happen to you? Because if you're not standing in the word of God and standing using the word of God, he will allow whatever you allow. Anything that's happening in your life is because you become lackadaisical, you become lazy in your efforts, you have not stood with the Word of God, you have not stood up and says, no, I am not doing this. Now let me give you a thought and process of this. Let's say that you know someone that's on drugs or alcohol or illegitimate sex or doing something that's, that we know is sinful. And every one of us knows what sin is. Now I'm not standing here telling you what sin is in you. I'm telling you what I'm telling you the Spirit of God's telling me to tell you. When you see somebody like that, you rebuke that devil of a spirit. Because it is a devil. You rebuke it out loud because private prayer, silent prayer, doesn't go anywhere. God wants you to hear you rebuking it. Because faith builds up in you by hearing. So when you hear yourself telling the spirit of alcohol or whatever the temptation is to leave that individual, then it will because there's somebody standing in the gap for that person. Is there no one that will stand for, is there no one will stand for our nation when we have leadership that cannot tell the truth? Cannot, to be honest with you, they cannot tell the truth. We don't know who to believe. We don't know who to believe. And we don't, we don't care who they are. Who can you believe? Well, I can tell you somebody you can believe. God says in his word that you can believe his report, and his report is I will take you through everything that's happening to you. I will take you through it. When you can't see any farther than the end of your nose. Now let me give you an idea about this. You have an attitude. I had a driver call one time and he said, I'm in up west of Cheyenne, Wyoming. I'm in a whiteout. I can't see and I don't dare stop because I'm afraid if I stop, I won't get started again because of the slick payment. So he began to, he, I told him, I said, bind, let's pray and bind that spirit that's troubling that, causing that storm in front of you because in second... Ephesians 2, it says, verse 6, it says, the prince of the power of the air. So we bound that blizzard and asked for visibility rise. And it did. And as soon as it did, instantly there was a, 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 a puppy trailer set right in front of him in the center of the road. If it hadn't prayed, he would have hit that trailer right in the rear. Running 30, 40 mile an hour at 80,000 pounds. You know what would have happened. Not good. Not good at all. Wake up, Leroy. There's going to be a hell of a truck wreck here in a minute. So when you realize, you have to take the thoughts of what is going on around you. When you get the report or you get the feeling bad, the first thing you do is you go to the Father. Say, Lord, help me here. I've got a pain. So he tells you to talk to your body. I had a call from a, from a lady who had been a registered nurse from Virginia. And I told this a week or so ago when she called me. She had lost the use of her hands. She could not tarp down her loads because she had lost the use of her fingers. And she said, I heard one of your CDs where I began to talk to my body. I began to tell my fingers and my hands to work. And in four days, she had complete use of her hands again. Glory to God. Now, I brought up a while ago that I had a call late the other night by a doctor, a medical doctor, who, who had had a few years ago, we prayed for him, and he went to Bethesda, Maryland. They were going to take all the lymph loads out from under his arm, and he never had to have the surgery. He was wholly healed, totally healed from cancer underneath his arm. Well, his mother called the other night and she said he's not doing good. He's not making any white blood cells. So we went before the Lord and asked God to cause the marrow of his bone to make white blood cells. That started working. Well, as soon as he got that report, here comes the enemy again with the thoughts. Here comes the thoughts. Here comes the, the attitude towards it. And here comes the action to it. And so he, she says uh, he's making uh, blood cells now. Everything's good there. But they've diagnosed him to have uh, cancer in the brain. All right. If you talk about letting the blood out of your face and watching you go from a, a, 
a smiling face to a very dead looking face. It's just like turning the light switch off on a person. It just drains all the hope out of you. It drains it out of you. But I'm here to tell you there's a father on the throne and he loves his kids and he's going to take care of business. Now here was the response. She had him call me. I prayed with him. I led him through the prayer how to stand against this cancer. That was about 7.45. Went to bed. About 11 o'clock, the phone rang, and it was him. And he says, some people at the church told me it was my time to die. Probably the pastor. So I'm getting ready to die. What do I do now? And I first thing came out, I said, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. You lying devil. You get off of that man. And this guy's a medical doctor. He knows all about all the treatments. He knows what the actions will be if he submits himself to it. He knows what's going to happen in front of him if he says, let's do it. But he's never trusted God because someone told him that it was his time to die. And I'm going to tell you this. No one will ever tell you that it's your time to die that knows what in the heck they're talking about because they don't know. It's, it is not under the heading of our business to know the minute of the hour or the second that we're going to die. If we did, we'd be preparing and laying up things for the future knowing exactly that tomorrow at 4 o'clock we're out of here. No, that's not the way God operates. You've got to operate in a spirit of faith. And the spirit of faith is on each and every one of us. So what is the attitude? What is the attitude towards something? What do you think about when you hear about? What did you think about when you hear the leadership of our nation make declarations like they do? What is your attitude towards it? Did you say, let's go to the Lord in prayer? Let's stop and pray that this is the right thing? Because there's people involved. There's people involved. And when people involve, God's heart takes care of His people. So you have to pray through the eyes of the Lord. You have to have His understanding. And the action that you and I take must be through the understanding. Whether we agree or disagree with what God says, we must learn to get, into, get aboard with Him because His way is the only way. So you begin to think about all the thoughts. You begin to think about where you've been. You begin to think about... Some of the things you've done in the past are some of the things that are happening in your future and how do you attempt to overcome them? Let's say that you've suffered a tremendous defeat. Say that you've got a, uh, a bad report from the doctor and the doctor's telling you there's literally no hope for you. What do you do? You rebuke the devil. You rebuke those thoughts. You make those thoughts that you have line up with what the Word of God says. Now first of all, you've got to believe that God is the healer. In Exodus 15, 26, he says, I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord, your healer. You have to understand that God is good all the time. James 1, verse 15 through 21, says every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, whom there is no shifting shadow. So you've got to make your mind up that God is good all the time and that he is not out to kill you or hurt you, or kill your children, or cause this nation to be the way it is, and the things that's going on, that is not God's plan. Satan's plan is I've come to kill, to mess up your life, to steal from you, to tear down everything that God's doing, and to give you false hope and all these other things. Now most generally people, including myself, anytime I'm standing up here in front of you, you're going to understand that I've been there and done that or done there and been there, or whatever, however you want to say it, I know what it is to hurt. I know what it is to be rich. I know what it is to be poor. I know what it is to be sick. And I know how to give God the victory. But the thing is, you've got to come to more understanding. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 through 11, it says, in 17 also, it says, God has given us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, in the knowledge of the anointing. What is the anointing? Let me show you something. I've been talking to God about my stomach. I say, okay, metabolism, burn this fat off of me. Now, I'm also exercising. Another thing the Lord showed me about this, in the thought process, he says, cut your calories back. It's much easier to lose weight watching your calories. What well, we eat like pigs, you know, we eat too much, we gorge ourselves, so then therefore we, and don't work it off, so we build up the tubby tuba fan. So you got to understand what's happening. So your attitude towards that. And then the feed we the feed the food we eat. I'm an old cattle person, so you know what I'm thinking. The food we eat is not always the best food if you gorge yourself on the wrong kinds, because certain foods turn to sugar, and that's the most abused drug there is. 
So you have to think about what you're looking. Now this you're saying, well, how does this get us to Jesus? This is church. Well, how do you want her to live? How do you know that tomorrow you're not going to get the bad report? How do you know that you might not get a pink slip in your, in your payday? How do you know? Y'all can watch this on the internet. Ed loads it up on those CDs. It'll tell you how to do it. Jerry at BNN.com. So you can pull this up. It'll be on this afternoon live. But interesting to say, you see all these religious people. They'll crank the, the jukebox up and the music up and we'll, we'll stand and we'll get in all forms of position of worship. Or maybe like this. Or maybe on bended knees. God knows your heart. He'll t some people tell you to close your eyes. Well, the reason you close your eyes, the, the evidence of that is to shut out the world around you. Where you can think for a moment or the thoughts in your mind come to rest. The battleground is in the mind of every human being. The battleground. Am I worthy? Am I unworthy? Have I done something to cause this that I'm asking God? Well, you'll have people come and they'll say, what are you, am I selfish asking for healing? Am I my husband or my wife from cancer? No. God wants you to ask. Matthew 7, 7 says you have not because you asked not. Or if you go to Isaiah 43, 26, it says, you've worried me all the time, every day, with all your sins, all your problems, but you've never come to me and asked me to take your case and plead your case and make it my case. We've never asked God to take our case and plead it. Well, Father, I just come before you today. I just plead that this whole congregation will fall out on the floor with the Spirit of God on them. I just plead, plead the blood of Jesus over every, this whole outfit. That the enemy is bound. That he can't do anything. That the finances will pick up. That the people will be cheerful givers. I just pray that this place will be a bountiful place. It will be a spotlight. It will be where a light is set on a hill. And nothing can put it under a damper. And we'll see the glory of the Father. And I just pray for the people that have, have cancers in their families. That the, that the glory would get to be our Father. That we would rebuke cancer by the power of Jesus' name. Cancer is a name. Jesus' name is greater than that name. In other words, it has more power. It has more power. You can talk to it. You can talk to the weather. Jesus rebuked the weather in the back of the boat. He says, ye of old little faith. Now let me give you another little shot in the dark that you've never thought about. In Mark 11, verse 22, it says, have faith in God. Amen, everybody? Amen. The next verse says, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, cancer, blindness, poverty, lack, job, whatever. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, shall have whatever he says. So when you start saying something, you're thinking about it. Duh. Are you not? How can you be a cohesive force against the wiles of the enemy unless you come in agreement with something. What are you in agreement with? Matthew 18, verse 18, 19, and 20. It says if two are gathered together, I'm in the midst of it. Well, when Jesus shows up, God the Father's there, and the Spirit of God is there. They're not separated from one another. They're always there. Where do they hang out? Inside of me and you, because our body is His temple. Then he says, when two will agree on touching anything, he said, I will do it. So there's the prayer of agreement. So what is the prayer of agreement? You have come in agreement. Two people have come in agreement. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit of God has come in agreement with you for whatever you're desiring. What are you desiring? A job. Or are you having favor? Let me give you another example of this. I had a man call the other night at, at 10 o'clock at night. And he said, I have no money. I can't pay my bills. But he said, a man's supposed to meet me, but he won't answer the phone and he hadn't showed up. I said, I prayed with him and I said, Father, we need help and then we need this man to show up and he needs to show up tonight. He called me the next morning. I said, are you praising God? He said, the man showed up and paid me. And you say, wasn't that a little short fused? God is not asleep, folks. But our thinking, our thought life has to line up with the word of God. Remember what it said. Renewing your mind daily with the Word. Well, you're busy. I agree we're all busy.
but you're not too busy to talk to the source of all power, to the source of all income, to the source of all life. You're, if you're too busy to do that, you're too busy. You need to rearrange your, your operation. You need to get an attitude adjustment. And if you think you're so doggone good looking, so powerful and so wonderful that you don't need God, I got news for you. One of these days your knee is going to bow and your heart is going to confess that He is Lord. Now I was told that when I was a little boy that the red eyes and bloody bones was going to get me if I misbehave. And so I, I hope that doesn't happen to any of us here today. I hope we're all believers and that we walk a repentant life. People use all kinds of things to get you under their authority because they like it. But let me show you something. There is only one person you need to, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. When you submit to Him, all this other stuff gets in line because He is the kingdom. He is life. In John 14, 6, He says, I'm the way. I'm the truth. No one comes to the Father except through me. And you will see people say, oh yes, I'm a believer and I've been baptized and I've been sprinkled and my sister was baptized four times. She belonged to a church that believed every time you sinned you had to go get rebaptized because she thought through the washing of the word that would change her from the inside out. But I got news for you. The only thing that changes me or you is the word of God by the spirit of God inside us. How can you love people when they're cruel and mean to you? You desire to. You make the attitude adjustment. I had a man call yesterday. His wife is a negative woman all the time. Everything she says is negative. I've never met her. Never met her. She is always negative. Always. And, and he wants to stay married to her. They've been married for a long time. But sometimes he gets to the place where, you know, I'm 65 or 67 or whatever, however age. He said, I am, I'm up to here with this. I'm out of here. You know what happens when he does that? He loses the anointing. He loses his walk with God. And who knows what else will happen? Because he opens himself up to the enemy. What he should do, I'm going to give you girls and boys some thoughts. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 4. When a man and a woman come together and become one flesh, the woman has authority over the man and the man has authority over the woman. And it is literally to the point of death because they are one. They are not separate. They are one. And when this man is not taking authority over that spirit that is troubling his wife, he is in sin. Because that's all it is that's causing her to be like that. Or if your wife is sick with some form of disease and you're afraid to lay hands on her, you weren't afraid to her when you made love to her and had your children, why are you afraid now to put your hands on her and command that sickness to leave her body? Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid to hold her and comfort her when she needs it? Or vice versa. The woman over the man. And I learned that when my wife laid in the floor dead for an hour and a half. The Lord kept telling me that was my wife my body in the floor and I was arguing bullheaded me I said that's not me down there Lord that's Bobby Lee no that's that is your body finally I got it the old think tank opened up yeah that is my body and I began to talk to that body and she came back to life standing right around there I've seen the Lord raise 28 people from the dead I know what I'm talking about when it comes to thoughts attitude and action You'll say, well, if you know all this, why don't you go empty the hospitals? Why don't you go to... You go where God sends you. If you go for any other reason, and we're all sent to go, and you'll say, well, when I get there, how am I going to know what to do? You will know because the Spirit of God is in you and you and you to tell you exactly what to do and how to do what God wants you to do. And so when you get your thought and your ideas laid aside, that's the reason you pray in the Holy Spirit. Because in 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 17, when I pray in an unknown language, my mind is unfruitful. You're not thinking about what you're thinking about. Now you tell me, when you lay down at night, 
you tell me that you lay aside all your thoughts. You do after you go to sleep, but sometimes in your dreams, you'll dream about those things you've been thinking about all day long. You've been pursuing, you've been fighting, and you'll dream about it. And the Bible says that in Joel, in Acts chapter 2, that in the last days, we're going to dream dreams and have visions. So in the middle of the night, we're going to have visions about things in the future. We're going to have things in the past. We're going to know all these things, and God's going to get the glory out of it. But the whole point is, when you pray in the Spirit, He puts those in there. The Spirit of God puts those things that God says about. You're going to say, well, I have many more things. The Spirit says, I have many more things to say to you, but you're not ready. Well, until you become more mature, you're just a baby, and you're still taking pablum or milk. And some of you have never grown beyond your water baptism. You've never asked the Father to fill you with the Spirit of God so that you have this knowledge. You notice I said He raised them from the dead. If you take his glory, you stop the anointing. You stop the prayer life. God wants all of us to operate in the full gifts of the Spirit. God wants us to operate just as Jesus did. And give him the glory. And we won't do that until we become obedient. Until we become submissive. It's like your little, if you have a child. If you ever watch a little boy, he'll mimic his dad. Watch a little girl, she'll mimic her mother. And, and we do that. We walk the same way. We talk the same way. Jesus said in John 5, 19, I only do it, say what I see the Father saying and do it. And so we see the Word in our thoughts changes our thoughts and makes us line up with what God's wanting us to say and do. Now go back to, to Ephesians. He says, lay aside every coarse thought and everything, that old man, that old self. It says, lay aside those things when you were a dumb Gentile. You were wor worshiping idols. Lay those things aside and come forward and look and follow me. So when you begin to follow after the Lord, then you'll lay aside all the teachings and the doctrines of your church. You'll go to the Bible, and what does the Bible say? Now, when you go to church, we go there to worship. Not to condemn one another. And not to put on the best suit, even though we ought to put on the best suit. We ought to look the best. But when you go there to please somebody other than the Father, you've gone there with misconstruity. The pastor, me, the Pope, the, the rabbi, we can't save you. We can tell you, we can help you, but we can't save you. Only Jesus can save you. Our daughter-in-law is Jewish. She doesn't practice the, the faith the way they do. She's a born-again Christian Jew. Well, I'm a Jew inwardly, Romans 3, because I've made Christ my, my Lord. But I'm not a Jew outwardly. She is both Jew inwardly and outwardly. So she knew that she needed something more than she had. Now, her mother was an Orthodox Jew and did not worship other than the way they do in the Old Covenant. And if you read Romans 9, 10, and 11, that codicil within the book of Romans, you're going to find that those people haven't brought their thought life, haven't entered into the covenant, and hadn't walked into the grace and the glory that God set before them when Jesus took the throne. And says there will be a remnant. So what about all those people that died that didn't know the Lord? What happens to you when you don't know God? Pretty plain. Whether you be Jew or Gentile. But those that knew the Lord, it was to Abraham, it was yielded unto him righteousness because he believed God. So you don't know their heart. So don't you sit here and start judging because when you do that, you get in sin. You're not somebody's Holy Spirit. You're somebody's witness. But you're not their Holy Spirit for conviction. I'm up here as a witness, not as your convictor. I can't convict you of anything. It's not even my business. But if I see you sinning unto death, it, I should come to you and put my arms around and say, don't do that. You know there's only one sin unto death, don't you? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, because if you reject Him, you'll reject God and Jesus both. And then there is no salvation. There's no way out of it. And there are preachers that preach against the New Testament, and they lose their salvation because they are preaching against the Spirit. Jesus said that in, in John 12. Matthew 12, excuse me, I'll get it right. Some people question these things. I used to wonder about all of them. When I, when, I, when I was a kid and outside the church, I saw things and my thought life was different than it is now. 
when I got under the covers, when I went into the church and became part of the body of Christ, I began to see things and see how people operate. A lot of people for, for a little while, when they get saved and filled with the Spirit of God, they're so full of love and they're so full of joy and they want to hug everybody and hold everybody. And here comes old Satan and he'll try to use that as, as some way to put a wedge in between the peoples. See, we're to love people un, un, without any problem. We're to love them with, with just pure love, just like God loves us. Without any, no, no reason to keep us unconditionally. He loves us. We're to love other people unconditionally, but we're not to agree with the sin they're living with. So what do you do? You rebuke the enemy, and there's 66 different kinds of sin in the Bible. There's 19 devils that Jesus cast out in the four Gospels that were all demonic angels, the fallen angels that were messing with people, including the spirit of death, spirit of epilepsy, spirit of blindness. All these things Jesus rebuked and cast those out of people. We have the same power to do that also. But now they can invite the fellows back. When you cast them out, if they go around and they, the, the, the demonic goes around, it says in Matthew, they go around, a little while time passes, and they come back and find that house clean and varnished and clean and swept. He brings seven other devils with them. You get people healed of cancer, which is a devil. You go through all the treatments to do whatever to get well. Time goes by, two years, three years, five years, seven years, cancer comes back. Because they never grew, they never put anything into place of it. It was clean, it was swept. You have to continually be growing in the Lord. If you're the same place you were yesterday in the Lord, you're backslidden. You're backslidden. If you're not reading the Word out loud to yourself every day, you're going to be backslidden. Because faith comes by hearing. Let me show you about prayer life for a moment. I met a woman in Houston, Texas one time. I was praying for her brother. She said, I've been praying 55 years for him to, to, to get saved. The name was Jane. Now my first question would be, why did you not change your prayer after so long? You know, if you haven't got the answer, why don't you say, maybe I need to go back to the drawing book and look within and see what other prayer. So why didn't she rebuke the lying spirit that was on her brother? the rebellious spirit, and asked for labors to harvest across her brother's pathway so that he could have gotten saved quickly. How much greater would, and how much more glory would God have got the glory of those 55 years in that man's life if he had lived for God all those 55 years? Now the man was brain dead when I met him. I laid hands on him and God raised him up from the dead. He got saved. And you know what he remembered? When I had a hold of his big toe and he's brain dead, he said, I remember an old boy had a hold of my toe telling me that I was going to talk to Jesus. And when I knocked on the door, he was talking to Jesus. You have to bind the enemy that is stealing from you. Life, health, money, children, family, country. You have to speak. You have to take thought. The Bible says take no thought of tomorrow. And we're all building for the castle when we retire. Most generally when you get to retirement you're so feeble and so old and fat and wore out you don't know what to do it and how to do it with it and you don't give a hoot where you do it or not. Go look around at the white age folks in our nation and what they do. They look for something to do. And people say, I just can't wait to, do, to retire. Let me tell you, the, the word retire is only mentioned one time. It's mentioned in Leviticus. And if you've been a priest in Levitical priesthood for 50 years, you can retire. And I don't know anybody in here is a Levitical priest. So you're not supposed to retire. You stay busy doing what God has called you to do. Whatever that vocation is, you do it. And you keep God at the center of it. You train up your children. Where do you train them? In their mind. You show them the thoughts, the attitude, the actions. You know, we when I was younger, we used to have bird dogs and we'd had feeders out and we'd, I don't know why I'm going here with this, but the Lord said, tell it. And we'd put feeders and we had always had quail and drought. We always had quail. And we'd have people that call from the city and they'd want to come out and they'd want to hunt birds. And I told them, I said, I'm going to tell you something. And some of them were preachers. 
I said, if you shoot a quail on the ground, that's sin and you'll never be invited back. There's some rules that you just don't break. You just don't break. If you want to, if you want to get a little better picture with it, every one of us drive, nearly every one of us. You break the laws, and you're going to pay a penalty. Sooner or later, you're going to get caught. One time, I met this young guy, and he had he was a bull hauler, and he wore his hat up on the side, and he thought he was God's gift to the bull hauling business. And he said, "I tell those DOT guys what to do." He said, "I tell them." He said, "I just blow through those scales, and I just overload and." I drive flat on the floor. I just just crank that old Peterbilt up, and I just three days later he's fired and he's in jail because they took his license away, tickets. And I'm going to end up. I'm going to end up with these last thoughts. Whatever is of good report, whatever is excellence, you dwell on those things. Inside of you, there's something called glands, adrenaline, brain, heart, lungs, liver, kidneys. The reason God wants to be your healer is this. We have a dear friend. She had an infection in her foot. She asked for prayer. She was prayed for. She goes to the doctor. The medicine they give her, the antibiotics they give her, what did they do? They shut her kidneys down. They shut her liver down. She called me and she says, I'm dying. I says, well, what, what are you not doing? She says, they're trying to get me to take dialysis. I said, don't be an idiot. Do everything you possibly can do after you've already committed yourself to this. Do everything you can do to live. I prayed for a little baby one time. This little baby wasn't developing. And they were afraid to put a feeding tube in a little three or four month old baby. Ignorance gone to seed. Put the feeding tube in. Put them on life support. Do whatever you got to do to keep them alive. Pray. Do whatever. Don't be foolish and don't be dogmatic in causing people to die unnecessarily because you're unwilling to listen. If you need to grease a tire, grease a tire. If you need to eat breakfast, eat breakfast. But do what you got to do. That is the action you take when you get in the walk of faith. You walk with God. You seek God first. You allow God to lead you and teach you and take you. And he may tell you to go over there and do this, that, or and whatever he tells you, you do it. And you will be successful. But if you go over there under the power and unction of your thinking, you're going to wind up flat of your face. Let me give you an idea. There's a radio station here in town, a Christian one. This guy goes over, he was offered a radio station, 100,000 watts, and he bought this thing on time, on notes. The Bible is very very strict in this. In Romans, it says, Owe no man nothing except to love him. What did they do? Ever since they've taken it on, they've been behind in the payments. And the guy's been lenient because he don't want the silly thing back. So they just, and now they're taking up special... uh, money raisers to try to raise the money to make the, to pay the payment. How many of us have gone and bought a house or a car or whatever and we'll say, well, I'm sure glad I got that a week or a month or two or six weeks. Why did I do that to myself? I can't pay the payments on the things I've got. Why am I doing that? And so we, we lust after things. And we're not, we're not asking God. Our thought process is broke down. Our attitude towards this broke down. Or maybe we've moved from another city to another city and we say, it's going to be better over here. Why did you leave over there? God had you over there for a reason. Do you think the grass is any greener on this side of the fence? No. It will be if you'll change and pray. He can take a, he can take a swamp and drain it. He can take a desert and make it, make it bloom. But you can't do anything without Him. So your thoughts, your attitude towards it, and your actions upon it will cause you to walk in the power and the glory that God said. I have people call. They're very wealthy. Very wealthy. And they say, I'm sick. I've got cancer. What do I do? God. They can buy the best doctor. But that don't always mean that you're going to be well. Only God can cause your body to heal. Only God can restore the things that you're asking for. 
Only God himself. No one else. Only God. The actions you take every minute of every day are going to be what you're going to feed on tomorrow and the next day. One of the most interesting things that God ever did for the children of Israel was, he said, I'm going to feed you. He told Moses, he says, tell the children, I want you to be very strict in this and I want you to follow me to the letter. I'm going to give you food from heaven. It's going to be called manna. But I want you to understand that you gather just the right amount every day and then on the day before the Sabbath, you gather twice as much because that will take care of you for the Sabbath because I don't want you working on the Sabbath. And what did they do? They porky-pigged it. They went out and gathered way too much and the worms got in it and it ruined and God couldn't trust them. When you have been trusted in a little, God will give you much. I'm going to tell you all, little as you know, this ministry right here is going out over the internet to thousands of people every day and lives are being changed. And I'm not trying to make you a denomination. I'm trying to point you to one person and his name is Jesus. And right this moment, I'd like, I'd like for everybody to just close their eyes for a minute. Father, we just come before you. We've talked about the thoughts, the attitude, and the actions. And right now it's a place where we're thinking about you. And Lord, some of us have sinned against you. And so we just ask you right now, 1 John 1, 9, that you're just and merciful to forgive us. So we ask you to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us. Cleanse our consciousness of that by your blood. And give us the hunger and the thirst to walk after righteousness and to study your word every day for a few minutes, to read it, to talk it, to think it, to meditate it, and to act upon your word. Because faith without actions is dead. And we, Lord, we know that some of these folks have tremendous health problems. So we speak to metabolism. We speak to hearts. We, Psalm 73, 26, The Lord is the strength of our heart and our portion forever. He's also the strength of our kidneys, our liver, our lungs, our whole, our whole makeup. And He lives in every fiber of it if we give Him permission. And Lord, I just ask You to fill every person with the Spirit of the living God right now, the Word of God coming out of them. And they will become pure in heart. I pray for this nation, Father, that the leadership of this nation, and I don't care who they are, from the least down to the lowest person, would walk in righteousness, and this nation would come back to God. And all these new people that have come from all across the world to this nation to be, to be people, Americans, that they would learn the language and learn to live in harmony with what's going on and come together as one people under God. And, and that they would walk in the mercy that you've set before them. We bind the spirits that is troubling our nation over race. In Ferguson, Missouri, we bind that lying devil that's causing people to hate one another. We hate that. And that's not of you, Father. You said come against that. We call for the people to rest in peace. And if there's been anything done that's not right there, Father, they will be prosecuted. Even in the highest offices, if they've broken the law, there will be penalties and it will not be good. And Father, we just come. We ask people that are in the hospital sick with cancer and disease and have no hope that you just go right into those, into those rooms there, Holy Spirit, and just deal with those cancers. We curse them and we cast them out. We call them to live just like we told that doctor that had brain cancer. We told you and we tell you now again, cancer, you cannot live in that body. You have been cursed. You come out of there and that new cells be formed. We thank you, Father, that this is happening as we very well speak. And Lord, we pray over the offerings that every person that helps us with this ministry be blessed a hundredfold and that we'd be able to give out tens of thousands of CDs more than we've already given free to anyone that wants them and that the gospel would go forth and then the Lord would come and get his people and then the righteousness would end time. Father, we just pray for this, this prayer list for Dr. Lund. We just thank you that that brain cancer is gone in Jesus' name. We pray for the little six-month-old baby that's, that's not fully developed. Bowen is his name, and we come against that. And Father, we lift up Larry, who will get out of the old covenant and get into new, because it is much better. The Spirit of the God is wonderful, and he takes us new places. And Father, we pray for Cindy right now. She, her mother has passed, and we just thank you, Lord, that you're the God of all comfort, and you'll show her how much you love her. And that her mom is with you, Father. She's not lost. She's with you. And Father, there's a family here that they need to 
repent of their sins and turn from their wicked ways. And every day ought to be a day of worship. Every day. In Psalm 103 it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name, who forgives all of our sins and iniquities, who heals all our diseases, who causes our youth to be renewed like an eagle, and delivers us from the hands of the snare. We give you praise in all these things in Jesus' name. Father, there's a person here that... uh, has back pain and and we just come against that back pain and we speak life into that we speak healing into those bodies in jesus name and there's some families that that they need to turn and and that they will in jesus name there's a woman named missy father we come against this stage four cancer you have a name and we command you we'll curse you in jesus name you come out and we cleanse that blood with the blood of jesus and we wash her and we reestablish every cell in the mar of the bone to make new blood And she is well, she is healed, she is whole, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the messages. And we we just praise the Lord that you have believed and received. You know, the Bible says in Romans 10, verse 8, Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord and repents of their sins, that he is just and merciful to forgive you, that Jesus was beaten, he hung on the cross, he was buried, and on the third day he came out of that tomb, and he gave mankind re- redemption and right re- re- restoration back to the Father. We thank him right now that he's blessed you and restored you. I pray that you prayed that, that prayer of faith. If you did, call us on that number there on the bottom of the screen, or email us, or write us, whatever you'd like. We will, we will be glad to hear from you. May, your, may you send your tithes and offerings to help us get, get this message out throughout the world. We hope you're having a blessed and a prosperous day. In Jesus Christ, amen.